All right. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for Living Well for organizing this presentation tonight. My name is Carly and I'm a genetic counselor located at the Warrenville Cancer Center. And I'm excited to be presenting to you all today about the role that genetics plays in cancer. Right, so to give you an idea of what we will be talking about during this presentation, I'll start off by sharing a brief overview about my role as a genetic counselor and the purpose of genetic testing. This will lead into a review of some of the basic concepts to um, about genetics to help familiarize you all with what genetics is. I'll explain the ma main difference between hereditary and sporadic cancers, and I'll share some examples of the most commonly hereditary cancers that we tend to see um, and how that may impact patients and their families. And then lastly, I'll share what our hopes are for genetics today and within the future. Uh, so to start off, genetic counseling is the process of helping patients better understand and adapt to genetic contributions to certain diseases. And this is typically aided by genetic counselors who have specialized training and education in genetics as well as counseling that provide personalized guidance and support to those patients that may be seeking um, additional information about genetic conditions and risks that may impact their health management and other informed decision making. In terms of reasons to see a cancer genetic counselor, I see a variety of different patients, starting off with patients who are typically unaffected. Um, I will see them um, because of a family history of cancer. So we will meet with them to help inform ways that they can screen for or reduce their risks for cancers. This may include additional screenings, whether that's earlier, doing them more frequently, um, with the goal that if we happen to catch a cancer, we catch it at its earliest, most treatable stage, or we'll discuss different um, surgical interventions or medications that may reduce the risks for those cancers. For affected patients, genetic testing may help them make informed surgical decisions or management decisions about their continued cancer screening or provide options about um, options for targeted therapies or medications. And then also genetic counts, genetic testing and counseling oftentimes can help provide an explanation or underlying reason for why someone may have developed cancer or why certain cancers are seen in several of their relatives. This slide here will be helpful for patients to understand what to expect from a genetic counseling appointment. So the first thing that we typically do will review the personal health history, the recent diagnosis for the patient, and any ongoing treatments or related care. The next thing we'll review is their family history. So I'll actually draw out a patient's entire family history, starting with their children, going up to siblings, parents, aunts, uncles, and grandparents. So I oftentimes find it very helpful for patients to come prepared to talk about that information and to have their family history ready. This can also help guide the different testing options that we'll talk about um, and can help guide uh, whether or not there are any hereditary cancer red flags that we'll notice um, within their family history and can guide our conversations about the suspected hereditary cancer syndromes. We'll also do a brief genetics education, which you all will get to experience in just a few slides here. Um, but we'll talk about how inherited diseases and conditions might affect them or their families. And we'll talk about the medical, emotional, and psychosocial implications that genetic testing might have. And then based on their personal or family history, we will offer specific genetic testing options that are the most appropriate and comprehensive based off of that patient's type of cancer or their family history of cancers. After we order a genetic test, the results typically take about two to three weeks. So once those results come back, we do review those with results with the patient and collaborate with their healthcare team to ensure that they're being followed appropriately. We also provide patients with resources and additional support to help them navigate this new information and share it with other family members. 
Moving on, we'll go ahead and jump into a brief genetics crash course. Um, this information will be helpful in guiding our understanding about cancer genetics and the role that the testing and counseling may play. So as humans, we have over 20,000 different genes within our genome, and we're all born with two copies of each gene. One is inherited from our mother and the other is from our father. Each cell within our body contains these genes, which act like an instruction or a code that create proteins that all have very unique jobs and functions within the body. So they may result in how we look or how we function. We have genes that perform certain functions like telling our heart to beat. We also have genes that actually work to stop healthy cells from becoming cancerous cells. And that's what we'll focus on today. Some of you may be familiar with the BRCA genes, which I will end up using as examples for today's conversation. Um, these genes and genes like it are good genes. They help protect our healthy cells from becoming cancerous over time. When genetic changes or errors occur within that code of a specific gene that's normally supposed to protect us, it can no longer do its job, and that can result in healthy cells becoming cancerous. These are genetic changes that can occur for a variety of reasons. The first reason may be just because of cell division errors. Our cells are continuously dividing and multiplying. And just like anything in the world, they're subject to normal wear and tear, which can result in random mistakes within our DNA that can occur when our cells multiply. Our DNA can also be altered from everyday exposures like lifestyle or environmental risk factors like smoking or UV radiation. And these genetic changes can also be hereditary and inherited from a parent. So as you can see, cancer genetics can be quite complex, but I always clarify with my patients that technically all cancers are genetic, but not all cancers are hereditary. While most genetic changes are, harm, are not harmful on their own, an accumulation of these genetic changes over several years can turn a healthy cell into a cancerous cell. The majority of cancers occur as a result of this process, which occurs over time. You may remember me saying a few slides back that we are all born with two functioning copies of every gene in each cell. And that's what that first um, circle with the two blue figures are showing. So when one spontaneous genetic change occurs in a single copy of that gene, there is actually a backup copy that carries out the normal function of that gene, protecting it from still protecting it from becoming cancerous. However, an accumulation of these genetic changes over time that eventually occur to both copies of a gene result in no functioning copies of that and can no longer protect the cell from becoming cancerous. So that cancerous cell then continues to multiply over time and can become a tumor. These are genetic changes that occur sporadically due to lifestyle or environmental exposures and are not inherited. So hereditary cancer then on the flip side um, is when an individual is born with a harmful genetic change or a mutation on one of those functioning gene copies within every single cell of their body. This is actually predisposing that individual to an increased cancer risk, essentially only having one functioning copy and being of that gene and being closer to developing a cancer. At some point in that individual's life, a spontaneous genetic change may occur on that single copy of that gene, resulting in that individual having cancer, and we tend to see those at earlier ages. In comparison, for people on the top part of that image, um, those individuals, we tend to see those cancers later in life. This leads to the role of genetic testing. Genetic testing is a test performed on a blood sample or a saliva sample, and it's used to identify whether or not a patient was born with a genetic change. It's ordered um, to read through the DNA and look for spelling errors or mistakes. So my patients may be familiar with me comparing this process to reading a, a 
uh, reading a book. Uh, the genes are essentially like sentences in a book and a harmful genetic change or a mutation are kind of like the misspelled words, which may disrupt the meaning of that sentence where it no longer makes sense to us. A cancer genetic counselor is trained to interpret these results and help confirm or rule out suspected genetic conditions and also help determine the chance of developing cancer or passing on that cancer risk. Whether or not a harmful genetic change or a misspelling is identified, a genetic counselor will work with that patient, their family, and their healthcare team to determine the best management or screening based off of their genetic risk. Likewise, when a harmful genetic change is identified, this can also inform other family members and their risks for developing cancer and how to tailor their own care and screening for cancer risks to be more proactive. And then lastly, genetic testing should always be voluntary. So we have consults set up with patients to provide them with all the necessary information prior to them moving forward with genetic testing so that they can make an informed decision on whether or not genetic testing is something that they would do or not do. Moving on, we'll dive into a little bit more about the differences between hereditary, familial, and sporadic cancers. One statistic that may surprise some people is that the majority of cancer is actually not hereditary. Hereditary cancers are only 5 to 10 percent of the time, which means that there is a genetic change that's being passed down with each generation, causing those increased risks for cancers. However, the majority of the time, cancer is sporadic. So cancer that is caused by chance, lifestyle, environmental exposures, things that may or may not be out of our control. And then lastly, familial is cancers that we oftentimes can see clustering on one side of the family, but more so due to a shared lifestyle or a shared environmental factor or a combination of those things and yet to be discovered genetic factors that we just can't test for. I mentioned earlier that we take very detailed family histories to identify common characteristics or red flags of hereditary cancer. So what are those red flags? Common general features suggestive of a hereditary cancer syndrome typically may include cancers at younger ages, so typically cancers under the age of 50. Other red flags may include rare cancers like um, uh, male breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, ovarian cancer, or cancers of both organs, so both breast, both kidneys, um, as well as multiple individuals within one family affected with cancer or an individual with a personal history of multiple cancers. We'll then talk a little bit about um, some examples of common hereditary cancer syndromes. Um, here I'm going to talk specifically about two of the most common syndromes that we tend to see and the genes that cause them. Um, however, one thing that I like to make sure that patients are aware of are that these are just examples. There are many other examples of hereditary cancer syndromes that we often also evaluate for um, with other features and associated cancer risks. The first hereditary cancer syndrome that I want to talk about is hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome. This is the most common hereditary cause of breast cancer, and this is caused by harmful genetic changes in the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. We all have the BRCA genes. Again, these are good genes in our bodies that function as tumor suppressor genes, and they regulate our cell growth and division and protect us from cancer. When a tumor suppressor gene has a harmful genetic change in it, uncontrolled cell growth may occur, which can contribute to the development of certain cancer risks. Um, so the image on the right shows the cancer risks associated with harmful genetic changes in the BRCA1 and in the BRCA2 gene in comparison to the general population risks. On the left, I've listed out some of the screening and management implications for an individual that may test positive for one of these genes. So typically for females, we would introduce earlier and more frequent breast screening. 
Um, we would also talk about risk reducing surgeries, so removing the breast tissue to reduce that risk. Um, for women that are undergoing a current diagnosis of breast cancer, it may actually inform their surgical decisions. Um, so maybe instead of doing a lumpectomy, they may elect to do a bilateral mastectomy. Um, so that's how it can kind of impact that surgical decision making for someone who's affected with cancer. In addition, because of the other risks for cancers that can be associated with genetic changes in BRCA1 and BRCA2, there are additional risks like ovarian cancer. Um, so typically recommending to remove the ovaries uh, typically after childbearing years. Um, and then for males, there are also risks. Males also have these genes, so if they were to inherit a genetic change, they can also be at risk for developing prostate cancer or male breast cancer. So we wanna make sure that they're being screened appropriately as well with earlier prostate cancer screening or even introducing male breast screening like clinical chest wall exams or offering, um, some males may consider a mammogram as well. There are other recommendations uh, also based on personal or family risk factors and even different medications or risk reducing agents, um, but I usually would recommend that patients talk to their doctors um, if that's something that they would consider so that they're um, reviewing the risks and benefits of those. There are different criteria for when genetic testing for breast cancer risk genes is indicated. Listed here are some of those risk factors that we typically would evaluate for uh, to determine if genetic testing is appropriate for patients based on their personal or family history. You may find that you qualify for genetic testing if any of these fit your personal or family history. And so in that case, I would recommend that you meet, um, uh, ask for a referral from your doctor to meet with a genetic counselor. Uh, some of you may actually be familiar with the story of the famous actress named Angelina Jolie. She had shared her story with the world back in 2013 um, when she spoke publicly about undergoing a risk-reducing bilateral mastectomy due to having a BRCA mutation. Her story actually led to a spike in genetic testing at that time, um, resulting in the BRCA genes being some of the more famous genes. However, while they are the most common hereditary cause, they are not the only genes associated with breast cancer risk. Genetics has actually evolved, so we now know that there are various different genes that work very similarly to BRCA genes that we also test for and also have risks for breast cancer when there's a harmful genetic change in that gene. So I have some of those other genes listed on the slide here. Um, and this is also a good reminder for those that potentially underwent genetic testing several years ago, only for BRCA1 and BRCA2, that current guidelines recommend updated multi-gene panel testing to evaluate for those additional cancer risk genes that may not have been previously tested for. So another reason to ask your doctor for an updated um, referral to meet with a genetic counselor. And some of these genes that are listed, some are more high risk, others are more moderate cancer risk. So it's very gene dependent in terms of the surveillance and management that may be recommended for them. And likewise, just like the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, there are other cancer risks besides breast cancer associated with these. So whenever a patient, if, if they were to test positive for a different gene, um, we always discuss what those specific cancer risks and management recommendations are once we get those results back. The next common hereditary cancer syndrome that I would want to talk about is for colon cancer. So Lynch syndrome is the most common hereditary cause of colon cancer. It's caused by harmful genetic changes in one of five different genes called mismatch repair genes. These mismatch repair genes are um, responsible for repairing any spontaneous replication errors that may occur during cell division. So when harmful genetic changes occur to these genes that are inherited, they do not function properly and correct those errors, which can lead to a buildup of um, those uh, errors and can eventually turn into a tumor. So the figure on the right are the common cancers that are typically associated with Lynch syndrome and the lifetime risks that are specific to each gene. The highest cancer risks are usually associated with colon as well as endometrial and ovarian cancers. 
For individuals with Lynch syndrome, management and cancer screening for these risks are modified. So for colon cancer, we change the frequency of colonoscopies um, as well as introduce upper endoscopies. Uh, the colonoscopies typically would occur every one to two years compared to those that are in the general population risks, which is usually every 10 years. The goal with this is because the risk for colon cancer is significantly increased that when we're going in and we're removing those colon polyps, we're catching and removing them before they ever turn into a cancer. And then for females, there's the increased risk for uterine and ovarian cancer. So for these cancers in females, we would usually recommend education on, import, on the importance of prompt reporting of any symptoms like abnormal bleeding, um, postmenopausal bleeding, pelvic pain, bloating, um, things that can um, lead to the potential for endometrial biopsies or considering to have the ovaries um, and uterus removed to reduce the risks of those cancers. There are other cancer risks associated with Lynch syndrome as shown on the figure and different screenings may be made available to patients like upper GI surveillance, earlier prostate screening for males, and even baseline pancreatic cancer screening if appropriate. And then likewise, there are also risk reducing agents like aspirin that's been shown to lower the risk for colon cancer as well as oral contraceptive that could lower the risk um, for ovarian cancer. But again, consulting with the doctor about those risks and benefits is always a recommendation. And just like breast cancer, there are also guidelines for when someone should be referred again for colorectal cancer genes, which I have lift, listed here um, as some of those risk factors. And again, there are several different hereditary cancer syndromes that can be evaluated for and may contribute to your personal or family history of cancers. And that's why it's best to meet with a genetic counselor to, who is trained to review your personal and family history and then determine the most appropriate and comprehensive genetic testing that can be offered for you. Most hereditary cancer syndromes follow what is called autosomal dominant inheritance. This means that when a harmful genetic change is inherited, there is a 50% chance that it can be passed down to children. In addition, we share 50% of our genetic material with our siblings, so there's also a 50% chance for them as well. In these cases, whenever there's a genetic change identified in a patient, genetic counseling and testing would then be indicated for their family members to determine if they inherited that same genetic change and would also need to make changes to their screening and management. After we order genetic testing, results typically take two to three weeks to come back. And with that being said, there are three types of results that we expect back from genetic testing. The first is what we've talked about most throughout this um, uh, presentation here, um, usually associated with, um, so positive results usually associated with increased cancer risks, management, surveillance recommendations, we help our patients navigate these conversations with family members and assist them with finding genetic counselors that are local to them to obtain that known family variant testing. I always like to clarify with my unaffected patients that having a genetic change in a gene does not mean that they will develop cancer. It doesn't mean that they have cancer. It's just a risk factor that now we are aware of and now we can change their screening to be more um, proactive. Um, likewise, for patients that are affected with cancer, it doesn't mean that you will develop a second cancer. It's just a risk factor for us to alter that surveillance and management for you moving forward. The second result, of course, are negative results. That means that of, of all the genes that we tested, there were no variants of clinical significance that were identified. So negative results never eliminate the risks for cancers. Um, we still typically would recommend for patients to follow their regular screening and doctor's recommendations and for family members to share their family history with doctors. There is, of course, always the possibility of a yet to be identified gene that just wasn't included on that testing panel available with today's technology. The third type of result is what we call a variant of uncertain or unknown significance. This is a genetic change that we've identified, but we don't quite yet know if it's something that's causing a risk for cancer or is just part of human variation, something that simply might make you different from someone else benign human variation. 
or could be benign human variation. With uncertain findings, we don't typically use them in any way to change a patient's management. Um, it doesn't inform any cancer risk until we know more about it. So usually the genetic testing lab that identifies that uncertain finding will continuously learn more about it over time, collecting more data, learning more about how that variant impacts health, and they will reclassify it. Uncertain findings, the majority of the time, I usually quote about 90% of the time, those uncertain findings end up being benign or harmless. So that's why we treat it as a negative result until we know more about it in the future. Moving on to talk a little bit about genetic testing today and in the future. Uh, there are several different genetic testing labs nowadays that offer a variety of genetic testing uh, that is available today. Um, I did see someone had a question about the cost for testing, so um, I was holding on to that question uh, for this slide here. But tests are becoming more efficient and becoming more accessible, as well as insurance companies are more and more insurance companies are starting to cover that testing. Um, so usually when I'm meeting with a patient, there are specific guidelines that genetic counselors follow to determine whether or not that testing is actually indicated based off of their personal or family history um, or not indicated based off of those guidelines. And we're able to kind of talk to those patients about the likelihood of insurance covering that testing or not covering that testing. In the event that insurance may not cover the testing, there are also options of self-pay. Self-pay at most genetic testing labs is around $250. Um, so I hope that answered your question about the, the cost for the testing. Let me know if there are other questions about that. Um, in other, uh, let's see, some of the other things about genetic testing today, um, there are some legal protections that are now available. Um, so genetics, uh, as of 2008, there was a law that was put in place called the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. Um, and that is a law that protects people from genetic discrimination in health insurance and employment. Um, and then our understanding in genetics is improving continuously and growing exponentially. So genetics has evolved a lot over time, uh, meaning that we're learning a lot each and every day. We're discovering new genes and we're get, having a better understanding of how these variations and these genes impact our health. In terms of what we would expect in the future, uh, genetic testing will be an important part of healthcare for many individuals, so we hope that this continues throughout the future. Um, I talked a little bit about the cost on the previous slide, um, but we hope that that may continue to decline. And then genetics will, um, we also hope that it'll deliver a more personalized, personalized and more precise medicine for patients, um, continuously helping with detecting disease risk, offering more accurate diagnoses to patients, guiding that treatment, and maintaining that health and care for patients patients and their family members. So I hope many of you found this session to be informative and helpful in many ways. If you do find yourself relating to many of the characteristics of risk factors associated with hereditary cancer syndromes, then I do encourage you to meet with a genetic counselor who can help navigate those questions or review personalized hereditary cancer risk. We do have various specialties within the West region and various genetic counselors that specialize in a number of different areas of genetics, um, so feel free to reach out. And um, so, yeah, thank you for listening. And with that, I will take any questions, any additional questions that you guys may have. Yeah, perfect. That was what I was jumping on to say. If anyone has any questions at all, um, feel free to either put them in the chat or just unmute. <clears throat> And um, the other thing I wanted to mention too, and I'm going to put it here in the chat as well, this talk will be up on our YouTube channel um, probably tomorrow afternoon. Um, so some of those slides that have some of the more in-depth information, you can certainly go back and take notes or go back and listen to what Carly had to say. So I will make sure that's in the chat. And I'm also going to put in the chat my email address. So if you guys have questions that come up tonight or tomorrow that you didn't ask today, I can certainly relay those and get those answers for you. Um, so if you guys have any questions, um, let me know. Otherwise, um, we will conclude tonight. So I'm going to put our YouTube channel here in my email. Um, otherwise, I think we are all set. Doesn't look like I'm seeing any questions. Awesome. So um, we do have one here, Carly. Um, why isn't genetic testing a standard of care? 
Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, I think that's something that maybe in the future could be something that um, would be introduced. There's right now different guidelines in terms of the likelihood of someone testing positive um, for a hereditary predisposition um, for cancer risk. So we tend to follow those guidelines for someone um, that we're meeting with. And so the other thing too is that offering it a standard of care, um, there are some people that may not want to know their genetic risks or want to know that information. It can be anxiety provoking. So, so we um, do have a lot of conversations about that with patients as one of the potential risks for genetic testing and learning about um, their risks for cancers um, and the management that it would introduce. That's great. We do have one more question here as well. Um, can you comment on the sort of OTC, the over the counter test kits like 23andMe? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, 23andMe is um, great for learning about general risks um, for yourself or even learning about ancestry, but it is not a clinical medical grade test. So with 23andMe, they are not sequencing or looking through the full genes. They do look at BRCA1 and BRCA2, but they don't look at all of the common um, breast cancer risk genes. So sometimes that can result in false positives or false negative results. Um, so we always would prefer that patients, um, instead of doing 23andMe, that they would meet with a genetic counselor to do a clinical grade test, um, just because 23andMe looks at some of the more common um, variants seen in certain ancestries, rather than reading through or sequencing through that full gene. So like I said, there it can result in some of those false um, negatives or false positives as well.